Thanks, thanks, Milne. Thanks for that. I'm going to assume it was you. But it has been at least a week since I've done this, so you can expect me to press the wrong button. <laughs> thanks. How are we now? Okay, I think yeah. we're good. We're good? Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, false start once or twice, but we are here once again to shuffle papers and recap the week in whiskey here on the Whiskey Roundtable. My name is Scott Fitzsimons, and I've been hanging out at fashion shows all day, uh, representing Corowa Distilling Co. I heard it's the next big thing, Vogue all over it, move over fashion brands. Uh, we are down one member of parliament today because Alex Dahlenberg has come down ill. Uh, she's going to go get some things stuck up her nose and get some whatever's put down her throat. Um, she's going to be lurking in the comments, probably on YouTube, being that's the weirder comment section, as we go through tonight. Um, Andy Milne is drinking weird peach flavoured RTDs in the South Trade office. Uh, Matt Bailey is drinking weird Japanese beers in the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society office. And we are very, very pleased to have a special guest, friend of the stream, friend of whiskey in Australia in general, Simon McGoram, who's made the mad dash back from Melbourne to be up with us here in Sydney, or albeit sitting uh, up north in his home with his wall of boutique whiskey behind us. To not only talk about the week, but talk about whiskey in general and his journey through these series. So, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, internet bots, we pay to keep the numbers on this stream up. Welcome to Whiskey Roundtable. And can I ask once and for all, what's in your glass tonight? I'm, I'm on brand for our guest tonight, so I am <clears throat> that particular whiskey from Glen Geary, a uh, 10 year old, which is tasting delicious. I don't have a boutique here at the moment, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Come on. I have, I have two bottles of boutique over there, but I can't see them and I don't know where they are. <laughs> <laughs> They're both open as well. It's like, ah, sorry, okay. Well, I'm, I'm starting off on one of our other brands from the Character Viola Whiskey Company. Got a little blend here called Green Isle. So I'm starting off nice and easy, and I'm going to try and finish off a few of these bottles that are starting to get a bit low behind me over the course of this evening. Good man. Yeah, I actually went searching for an open bottle of Boutique because I know there are a few that have been open at the Oak Barrel in the past 12 months, uh, and I have drunk them all. Uh, so I'm actually cracking a new one uh, tonight, um, albeit something I'm familiar with and in miniature form. Uh, but I just did the lucky dip, reached into the box, and uh, I've got a Royal Brackler. Ah, oh, very nice. Yeah, nice. Old, to, uh, to crack. And I'm uh, I'm a fan of this one. It's uh, – and we, we might get into this. It's sort of summed up boutique in Australia for the past, you know, couple of years, past 24 months, uh, this sort of release, which I think is really cool. Uh, but, Simon. Yes. Welcome, well, welcome to the stream. How's your day been? And um, and how did you – you just managed to get out of Victoria in uh, in time last week. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was down there for a whiskey tasting supporting the launch of our uh, Australia series for Boutique at Whiskey and Almonds and flew down on the Wednesday afternoon and was quickly racing back up to uh, Sydney Thursday morning when the lockdown looked like it was going to be inevitable. So, yeah, it was a bit of a close run thing. Uh, it was my first trip back to Melbourne since uh, since COVID and I was really pumped to be there. So, um, glad I snuck in there. Real shame to see uh, Melbourne go back into lockdown, but hopefully they can uh, beat this and um, be back in action soon. Yeah. Um, I really, really miss that town. Um, did manage to go to Whiskey and Almond and Elysian, so I, I did try and make the most of my time whilst I was there, less than 24 hours. Yeah. It's, um, you know, we, we do really feel for Melbourne. I spoke to a few venue operators and owners in, in Barwood, but also in restaurant world, um, and obviously the, it's been extended for another week uh, now and it's a bit touching her. So we, we do feel for those guys. And as you say, hopefully they can break out of it because that's uh, it's not a fun position to be in. Just like it, when it felt like there was a bit of momentum building up, it uh, the rug gets pulled. But I was actually lucky to be down in Melbourne um, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, and I did pop into Elysian and, and Whiskey and Almond. Just unannounced. I wasn't really there on whiskey business, um, but, you know, you got to go and did exactly run into people who – I'm pretty sure we're there the last time I was there two years ago. So even though it's, it's coming back, the community was banged straight back into gear, which was really cool. Um, yeah. You've been back, um, Bailey, haven't you? Uh, about twice a month, all year. Yeah, okay. Busy yeah. man. Yeah, running Busy. around. Uh, I've been in Melbourne. Yeah, I've been in Melbourne about six times. Well, not almost, almost twice a month. I've been in Melbourne six times this year, and we're just out of May. So I oh, know a little bit more than once a month. Yeah, but, I mean, I've been there a lot this year, which has been great. Um, with our, we had our Melbourne whiskey cruise. We had 
a few tastings at Whiskey and Almond, a few different restaurant events as well. It's um it's always been busy at the society as as you know, but yeah, it's 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 kind of a real shame to see because unlike Simon, I was I I was supposed to be there on Thursday last week, and it was like Wednesday for me in Sydney, and I was like, it doesn't look like I'm going anymore. So I, I think our flights sort of crossed paths, but I had to cancel mine. And thankfully, uh, the the flight operators these days are being very uh very uh generous with their flight credits. Yes. Yeah. Um. Yeah, we, we, we hope you'll get out of there. A quick g'day to Alex Dahlenberg. Uh, I could call a friend yeah. of the team probably, but um, she's sitting there uh, feeling a little bit crook at the moment. So um, as I say, she's going to be lurking and marauding the comments sections. Uh, so feel free to uh, – there you go. And, yet, Scotty, I'll kill you for that introduction. Uh, but this is great. Like, I didn't even have to mute her uh, to get my words in. Yeah, and you know when I'm when I'm saying stupid shit because she's she's not here today. But I mean, um, this is the last day you're alive, though. Let's be honest. I mean, <laughs> well, let's make it a bloody good show then. Uh, let's make it a bloody good show. <laughs> um, Simon, I've been involved in uh, whiskey from a you know professional and full time basis for you know about seven or eight years in Australia. Here, um, Bailey's about the same. Um, every show that I've been to through that whole process through tastings and shows, you've been a constant face uh, on the Australian whiskey scene in various roles that you've had. So do you want to maybe give um, people a bit of a rundown of how you you, you started in, in Australia and then uh, the, the, you know, the, the steps you've gone to where you are today? Yeah, you sure. Know, I mean, you're saying that in the context of you being a Kiwi, of course. Come on. <laughs> oh, well, I'm waiting for himself to drop himself in. So. <laughs> yes, I did come from New Zealand. Um, but, no, of – I really came at uh, the whiskey industry via the bar industry first. So um, I've been in the bar industry for uh, well, 21 years, bar and drinks industry. Uh, so right after leaving school, went to a gap year in the UK, did my first trip to Scotland, visited my first Scotch whiskey distillery at the age of 18 and, and fell in love with it. Which one uh, was it? Oban. 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 And absolutely love Oban. And I um, just got back there couple of years ago it was 18 years between visits um so i was 18 when i first went there and then half my life later uh went back there again which was awesome it's a beautiful town and i love the whiskey as well i wish we could see more of it and love to see some indie bottlings of oban i'll tell you what um, <laughs> that would be great so it only give up uh you know, a few casts uh but yeah in the bar industry for ages um you no know, won some awards uh you no know, shaking tins and making cocktails in new zealand and uh, started writing for an Australian uh, bar trade magazine and uh, eventually decided to move over to Australia, chasing a girl. The girl didn't work out, but um, Australia very much did. And then I've been in and around the drinks industry in Australia since I moved over here in 2007. Uh, yeah, I was doing a bit of drinks writing and uh, then started um, doing some brand ambassador work and uh, really sort of focusing on whiskey. So for... Um, behind bars and agency, which um, sort of hired me out to Diageo, started doing whiskey tastings and trainings for them, would be back in 2011, 2012. And so, yeah, for about the past decade, I guess, been working in whiskey and uh, um, ended up opening a bar, doing, doing keep on, kept a little bit of drinks right and going for a while, then went back to whiskey uh, in a more sort of full-time capacity for a couple of years as Diageo's national whiskey ambassador. Which was which was great fun, um, yeah. You, you know, I, I it was your longevity in the trade. Uh, I didn't fully realize until I had to do some research for the tenth anniversary of whiskey and helmet bottling that we we're doing with the uh, society, and they picked out a cask and it was to celebrate ten years of of them, and they took on the whole cask, which was great. And I was I had to do some research to find some of those early days to write about an article for them, and I yeah. came across this article that said about the launch of Shea Regine, and it yeah. said. <laughs> Simon McGorham, and I was like, "You wrote this article ten years ago." It's like you were writing this article before even like it was whiskey and Almond, and I was like, "That's rather cool." Just to find out yeah. that the history of your your place in the trade that was great. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been a big sort of cocktail nerd for a long time, and used to get a lot of stick for being a real nerd. I was writing about cocktails and bars before it was cool. Know, which we have on the internet was there. Like, mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of resource on there. Um, and I was re no, researching cocktails and, um, you know, um, Jerry Thomas's How to Mix Drinks before that was a widely known text. Um, and that, that was great. I was sort of at the forefront. These days, you speak to a modern bartender, I know nothing. I'm not going to be able to tell you how to lacto-ferment a plum. 
um, and, and and make banana wine or anything like that. That's not my jam. That's my second question is lactose. <laughs> yeah. so it could be plum, we want to talk about the plum industry and, and the lactose industry as well. So, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Bugger. <laughs> I'm screwed. But, yeah, yeah, I mean, the stuff the guys are doing these days absolutely blows my mind, the level of technicality we see in uh, in the bar industry. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I think of a highball as being whiskey and soda, maybe use a flavoured mixer, um, but uh, it's so, so much more if you go into one of the top cocktail bars these days, which is awesome to see. I want to do a um, quick, quick shout-out as well to a few people jumping on the stream here as well as uh, Alex. We've got Crafty Field from the uh, – Craftworks Distillery, Whiskey is My Jam, James Finnegan, John Jarvis from Hobart Distillery, uh, and Gary from uh, from down in Tassie as well, and, of course, Dave Worthington from the Boutique Whiskey Company. G'day, uh, Dave. G'day, mate. Tuning in. Um, and uh, we've seen many, many instances of Dave and Simon on the screen together in the past 12 months. But um, you, you, you did the Diageo thing, um, and the Diageo thing is all-encompassing because you need to be able to run – Johnny Walker whiskey tastings at, you know, car dealerships and at high-end restaurants and that sort of thing. And then, you know, get into a room full of society and oak barrel customers who want to nerd out about clone leaf distilling techniques. Um, and then you, you, you've stepped, stepped into now Adam Brands, which does a whole gamut of things. Do you think the Diageo job sort of prepared you for, for Boutique and Adam or like are there many relationships between the two? It's a very yeah. different. It's a very different step, isn't it? I mean, it's sort it of like one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest, to, uh, one of the most independent in some ways, like in terms of whiskey brands. And in- yeah, it, it is a huge step. Um, it was you know, quite a quite a change. I mean, I was an ambassador, so I was working in advocacy, working alongside the brand team and marketing. Um, so my role was more kind of ancillary to marketing, and now I'm very firmly in the commercial side. One of the great things about working for a smaller company like Adam Brands. I'm the only person in the APAC region that works for the company. So uh, I have to wear a few hats. So I get to host tastings and do all that advocacy stuff that I really love. I really enjoy talking about whiskey and being up in front of a crowd. And so I still get to do that. And that's one of the things I always enjoyed um, when I was working for Sweden Chili and for Diageo as their whiskey ambassador. Um, no, both great companies to work for. And I felt I really learned a lot at Diageo that has set me up for this role. Um, and you know, it's a much smaller company, so there's probably a little bit of a gap on how a, a big company operates to how we operate. Um, you know, you have a look at the, the lead time for a company like Diageo to bring a new product to market, the NPD process takes years. We're at Atom Brands and, and Boutique, we're all about fail fast, we want to bring something to market quickly, and we don't care if it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, that's fine, we move on, we'll try something new. Um, but we're able to bring products to life very, very quickly and see if they're really a thing. So, yes, we have um, boutique whiskey. Um, you might have seen Character Viola whiskey. You might have seen Darkness whiskey. But it's a whole host of new um, brands that, that we're working on. And that's quite an exciting part of the business. I don't have a lot to do with that, but I love seeing what the guys and Adam Lambs come up with, um, which is run by one of our founders. And he's just a bit of Ben. He's a bit of a mad scientist. So he was the brains behind Boutique when we first launched back in September 2012. Um, but he's also um, no, still involved very much in creating all the weird and wacky stuff that we're coming up with. Unfortunately, no um, sheepdog uh, peanut flavored whiskey, though. And that's, that was already taken by. It's, in, it's in the pipeline, though, surely. <clears throat> you'll, you'll be ready with a competitive brand. Well, <laughs> I've, got, I've got a finger lime gin here. And then I've uh, a, a cherry gin. I, be, I believe the uh, country's out of the, the spit roast pineapple and that sort of thing. But surely there's a, a, a like a, a peanut butter gin in there somewhere that that can come through. There's there is uh, a bit of a rule at um, Adam Brands that you just never mention a new idea in front of uh, Ben, our founder Ben Elson, because uh, he will just make it happen. He will create it, no matter how ridiculous the idea is. So you've got to be really careful with what you say, or you'll next you'll find it it's uh, for sale up on Master of Malt. So um, yeah, we are careful to mention new ideas, but we like you just showed Boutique Gin. Boutique Gin we launched in 2016, 2017, and on the back of that, we won um, UK uh, Gin Producer of the Year uh, in 2017 and 2019 at IWSC. So we've got real credentials as a gin producer as well. 
Um, we don't distill a drop of whiskey. Um, no, we, we blend and bottle, uh, but the gin we do distill, and we're very proud of what we've been able to do with the gin. And um, we're all about really sort of pushing the envelope. Um, you know, people ask us, why did you do that? And our answer is, why not? Uh, we wanted to sort of push the, the barriers of what constitutes gin. And we're seeing more brands do that now. You're starting to see, you know, flavoured, uh, you know, more flavoured gins come into market. That might not be your thing, but it's definitely a growing brand. And there's a lot of stuff that we create that might be more suited to the at-home drinker than, you know, that's going to be sitting in trendy bars. Uh, but we we have products for those trendy bars too. But we, mm -hmm. we're here to talk about whiskey, really, aren't we? Sorry. You know, and if you Ben is listening. We've got a bit of a suggestion here from Matt Wooler, uh, a cheese, cheeseburger gin. Maybe, uh, Dave, if you could mention in your next conversation. Um, on, a, on a completely unrelated note, I've actually had a few people come to me and say there's a real appetite in Australia for a series of whiskey bottlings matched to fountain pens uh, as well. I don't know why that just came to my head. Um, no, no. Don't listen to that. That's not a suggestion. That is not a suggestion. That's, no. uh, that's just completely unrelated uh, concept. But um, is, it, is, that, so is that when you're going for a nib and a nip? Oh, 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 this shit is writing itself. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's going to be Australians' versions of half and half, you know? All right, cut, cut him off. Uh, <laughs> Simon, can I just ask you, can I just ask you, uh, something I've always loved about the boutique releases has just been that sort of like, I guess, fun approach to whiskey, uh, especially, I mean, it is fair to call the boutique an independent bottler uh, of yep. spirit. Um. And it's it's always been that realm of independent bottling, uh, especially from the much more older, older, older established uh, brands out there, uh, has always been quite a for 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 a relative newcomer has been sort of like a almost a, a, a silly unknown. Like you wouldn't touch it because you don't understand the brand; it's not recognizable, or it's too stuffy, or it's too, you know, as as we know from what these bottles look like over the years. That artwork, how do, how have, how have you seen the um, <laughs> the the Consumer perception on the artwork side of boutique because that's always been the part for yeah. me that's jumped out is that is yeah. the artwork and because a it's so colourful and, and it, it's just fun and irreverent but it also does link to the actual release. Yeah, absolutely. It, I mean, for us, we didn't know. I, I'm, I'm speaking for the people that created boutique, but boutique didn't want to out SMW SMW SMWS. We didn't want to out Cadenhead William Cadenhead. Uh, we didn't want to out Gordon McPhail Gordon McPhail. There are a lot of bottlers that do what they do very well. And they just really wanted a different approach to how they um, bottle whiskey. We want it to be fun. We want it to tell stories about the whiskey. We want mm. the people to focus on what's inside the bottle as well, rather than looking at what was the fill date of that cask, what yeah. type of cask it was. Um, no, was the moon waxing or waning on that particular day? I mean, who, who gives a fuck? Is that really going to change what the whiskey inside the bottle? I mean, yes, it will. But is, what, is that, what do those words mean to you when you try the whiskey? What are they surely, actually? Surely, you, surely you follow the lunar patterns of you know <laughs> distillation. Exactly. So we, we just we, we wanted to have close to biodynamic wine making, and I hear that all of, all every day <laughs> from the wine department. So that's the yeah, I mean it's yeah we we really wanted to just tell a bit of a story about each of the liquids that are in the bottle. We'll tell a story about the distillery. Sometimes we couldn't find anything interesting about the distillery, so we just have a really silly label. I think I've got an example here. I'll find one behind me. So that's that's a way of saying it's a really boring distillery, but you still took the sure. spirit. I mean, here, I mean, this is a Glen Dullen bottling. This is uh, the brief for this label was Space Olympics, which is what the label is. It's Space it, Olympic. It's it's funny you say that, Simon. At, at tastings where I've had uh, a society uh, Glen Dullen in the lineup, I've I've often referred to it as you can learn a lot from the name of this distillery. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's so sometimes it's, it's a little bit dull, but that doesn't it, that doesn't detract from the spirit. Exactly, a lot of time there's not really anything that interesting to talk about with a distillery. You know, many of them are quite similar in how they go about doing something, especially in in Scotland. But you know, the spirit is what really really matters. Um, so yeah, the labels are a bit of fun. They're all done by Emily Chapel, who's been with us right from uh, day dot. She's uh, a Glaswegian artist. And um, I, I can't, I'm not going to get the story right, but I believe she actually met um, uh, Ben or a couple of guys from, from Adam Brands anyway uh, on a, uh, I saw the original brief and design, says Dave. Great story behind, okay. There's this bit of a story there, which Dave is going to probably jump in and say in the comments. Um, 
but no, I originally met them or met um, the guys from Adam on a boat cruise in Loch Lomond as well. So she um, no, enjoys whiskey and has been uh, been been working with us since, since day dot and does some really cool stuff. Um, no, her labels are fantastic, and spent, the closer we work with the distillery, I think the best res, that's where we get the best results from the labels, particularly with the Australian series uh, that we did recently. I thought the labels were no fantastic. The Bakery Hill was a real standout for me, but all of them I really loved. We, we work really closely with the distillery, and, and we can really um, capture the characters that involved in, in making that uh, that whiskey. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting point. I mean, you, you say there, and you know, we try not to judge whiskey by by its cover and that sort of thing. But I remember when I started at the Oak Barrel and took over the reins of buying here about six years ago, really couldn't get boutique in Australia. There were there were scraps of it. You know, you, you saw it overseas, particularly from Master of Malt, um, who, who's a, a shared company. But it, um, you know, you really couldn't get it. Um, but I was drawn to the to the bottling and the bottler because of the fun element of whiskey. And if you go back five, six, seven years, I think, you know, Matt and, and Milne, we've spoken about this many times, there was a real element of fun missing from whiskey in, in Australia. And I have had yeah. on occasion a couple of people, you know, come up and say, oh, gee, I love that boutique stuff, but gee, I can't stand their labels. But they're also the people that work, walk out because I don't have Macallan 18 for sale for 149 bucks. You know, that's, it, so – I like I see like the the pickup on those bottlings is really cool and and even before some, you get the release you know it's going to be fun it's going to that have that that element of um, you know adventure about it. Mm. It's like it's like those people that say that you know Jameson should be forty three percent you know it's that kind of misconception. Oh, oh wow yeah. wow that's, that's <laughs> the most historical spicy burn I've ever heard actually that was one of, that's a that's a, that's going back like a year of callbacks there. Yeah, takes I mean, that time for a comeback. Yeah. Be, be, before we before we move on, now we, we do have a bit of backstory on the um, Glendullen label here. So I, I, did, I did know this. I did know this, Dave. Thank you for reminding me. But yeah, the original brief from Ben was to uh, do a label featuring a mash tun, a cross section of a mash tun. It's a bit going to be like our Ard uh, more label. Have you ever seen it? Which is a cross section of a barrel, and uh, it, it, no, we saw the line drawing. He showed it to Ben for approval. And uh, it just said it was, you know, Ben just found it really boring already and said, here's a new brief, um, Space Olympics, have a little bit of fun. So that was uh, how Space Olympics came about. Um, and that, that's the main thing is that we want to have a bit of fun with our labels. We want the whiskey to be fun. And just to your point about people being sometimes put off with the labels, yeah, that happens. We'll bottle a 30-year-old Macallan in exactly the same packaging as we might have a six-year-old unnameable space side. Like it's not, we're not about crap loads of packaging. We're not, we, we don't come in lacquered boxes. It's about having fun. It's about the whiskey that's inside the bottle. And we want it to be accessible. If you put it in a decanter in a lacquered box, you're going to have to charge you another 300 pounds for it. So we don't want to do that. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're one of the few independent bottlers that I'm sure Matt's going to disagree with pretty quickly. But you're, you know, most traditional independent bottlers or you know, most well known are bottling scotch a bit of american but you guys you know i've had milk and honey from you guys you've had you know this whole um, australian release there's been uh, some paul john from you guys there's been uh, i think some taiwanese whiskey at some point yeah, we've um, done, you're, we've done you're going everywhere to the the less traditional whiskey making countries and not not afraid to i think the milk and honey was only three years old i think it was you know it's it's well, it's not you're not afraid to, to it, was, it was a one-year-old malt spirit the milk and honey so um you know dave who's on the stream will actually say that uh you know whiskey's created in the distillery not in the warehouse is one of his favorite sayings of late and that's because yeah we are bottling some young stuff but we you know really good spirit does shine through and um you know we had tried an amazing uh, two-year-old um, uh, Kilara um, in the Aussie series. Really fantastic spirit. Um, so we're not we don't we're not afraid to bottle stuff that's not yet classified as whiskey. We will do that all the time, um, and we'll eventually bottle bottle stuff that is older and is whiskey too. We've just uh, um, recently um, uh, about to release rather a thirty-eight-year-old Altmore, the oldest Altmore we've seen. Um, we've got a forty-four-year-old Glen Talkers in bottle. Um, we've done 50-year-old blends. Like, we're really not afraid to um, release old whiskey as well. But um, we will bottle some younger stuff. Um, we do really like world whiskey. 
we we believe that we celebrate sort of the um, the, you know, the world of craft craft whiskey, and we don't just want to be Scotch centric. We will always do Scotch whiskey releases. The nature of Scotch whiskey means that there is a good market there for independent bottlers. It is accessible because so much of it goes off to fillings. We are always going to be get, able to get access to um, to cast of Scotch. But we like working with distillers all around the world and developing a direct relationship with that distillery and showcasing what they do because that's exciting and it's just it's a great story to tell. You know, we're telling people in the UK and Europe, um, you know, what's going on in Australia, and and they're they're listening and they're really excited to see what's happening down here. I, Andy, I don't disagree with you. I don't disagree with you. That's we, we bottle it from just as many countries in society as as boutique do. I mean, it's. It's it's a it's a world market now. I think we've got eighteen countries or something that we bottle from these days. They're probably much the same for around the same number for boutique. I'm sure. I'm, uh, well, I'm not... I think I think we might beat you a little bit. But I mean, we've done South Africa. We've, we know, done... we've never done, well. We've not done South Africa. We've never done Israel. I know those two are on our yeah. on our radar. But yeah, um, yeah, we've done. Um, obviously, we would have done Japan. We've done India. We've done so, Switzerland, yeah. Sweden, Finland, Germany. Uh, yeah, we've done a few. We've done a few. Um, Dave can probably say how many countries, Dave. You'll probably enter in on the chat in a second. Um, more, more than that is yeah. always all we need. <laughs> <laughs> we, I mean, boutique bottle almost as many countries as a society does. It's great. It's it's really good. It's really good to see. <laughs> we don't we don't bottle we don't bottle boutique cognac yet. There's no boutique Armagnac. Ah, there you go. Well, if you want to add them up, then yeah, I, I they've, got, we've they've done, got the rums. Though. We're done. We've done some really good rums. And uh, I think we have bought some brandy. I don't know if boutique brandy will ever be a thing, but uh, I know that the guys do love their brandy. I'm on the rum tonight. There you go. It's um, yeah, it's it's really interesting. I want to do a quick shout out to Vicky Dahlenberg, mum of the stream, who says no swearing, go figure. Uh, <laughs> Alex is not the stream tonight. Um, but based on the fact that I can pick on her in the intros, I think she is swearing at home. Um, she does have a microphone and a camera on tonight. And uh, shout out to, to Frank Murphy, who also points out that Cadenets have a few, a fair few international yep. auditors as well. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot to do. I think for me, though, we, we've spoken about this with the Australia series that's just been released. You know, 40% of the outturn, whatever it was, came to Australia. The others have gone to the world. And I think we sort of sit here and go, okay, how is this being, you know, accepted and who's it going to? But by the other token, you know, some of the first instances I've tried international stories have been here have been through boutique um and i know that an upcoming series that's uh, on its way to australia at the moment has distilleries from uk that i've never heard of before let alone tried like things that i've and i, I should probably know this but i think that's really exciting i think you know yeah. maybe uh, there's potentially a price point difference as well um that that is it makes it a little bit more accessible so i think that's really interesting um and, uh, and how much we're allowed to give away about that series yet, uh, uh, Scott. But yes, there is some very exciting stuff coming up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know too much about it because I, I saw the sheet and I have no idea who most of them are, so I can't offer any insight whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, one of the releases I will hint at that we got, we got the very first cask from that distillery, literally cask number one, um, that we're going to be coming up in one of our um, bottlings uh, later in the year. That we do have a little bit coming out to Australia as well, so... Um, that's exciting. It's exciting. For sure. Uh, bit of bit of bit of confirmation here from uh, Dave. I believe the Society have bottled more Scottish distilleries, um, but they have been around a little longer than us. Um, but I think probably have the country. And I, I'm glad this is descending into boutique versus society. Um, <laughs> Not a competition with two totally different. One of the, uh, first of all, we're a whiskey club. But, you know, it's a, first and foremost, it's a different thing. But I know True. you like wrapping me up, so that's okay. I, I'm. I'm I'm immune to it now. I'm immune. So um, yeah, so Ro Roslyn Frame is just making sure I don't say anything. It's top secret. Roslyn I love it. I love it as a cavalcade of, as a cavalcade of Adam staff just hanging on your every word here. In the I know. Chat. I know. I can't. I can't see that line. <laughs> the, the P the P forty five is sitting there waiting to be signed. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and and I can just ruin it for everyone in one. <laughs> And suddenly you're if we just saying it up distilleries, maybe something will happen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're up to about 5,000 distilleries in, in America now. So we start just saying them, just start A to Z. There you go. Yeah, oh. <laughs> yeah that'd be pretty tough. <laughs> um, 
we, we, we touched on it. There's been a few comments in, in the chat about it. I know um, Crafty mentioned he loved the uh, Australia series. Brie Atwood from the uh, Backwoods Distillery in Yak and Dandis is the bakery label label is the best. First time I'm jealous of another whiskey label. Um, the Australia series was a huge success in Australia, sold out almost instantly. Um, certain uh, distilleries had certain you know quantities in their outturns and that sort of stuff, so stuff sold quicker than others. Um, have you had any uh, sort of... Uh, you know, insight into how the series has been, you know, uh, received overseas? Look, it's been received incredibly well. Um, I mean, we've only been doing these theme releases. Uh, this is only our third or, or no, third um, theme release that we've done. We started with a, uh, a World Series, a Rye Series, and then this Australia Series. So it was a new model for us. Um, before we were you know, releasing lots of delicious releases, but they were kind of, there wasn't any sort of, real plan to it that I could see anyway. They might correct me if I'm wrong. We just bottled delicious stuff. Uh, but now we're sort of tailing that in and, and, and doing you know, what sensible people do at SMWS and do an outturn. Um, and yeah, it's been it's been received re incredibly well. Um, you know, the, the whole allocation of the Australia series uh, you know, went um, straight away to all our distributors. And then from what we can tell, I mean, I don't know what's sitting, sitting on shelf and, and and uh and shops but it has been going really really well um no it, it, we didn't have any problem uh selling that that's for sure yeah, yeah. um for, for for those of you um but, but, but who don't have access to our behind the scenes here uh we've currently got andy and um bailey madly trying to guess the stories but i think uh rosalind's actually i'm not giving it away i'm not okay. giving it away she's okay. actually thrown a um a curveball there it's a riddle the distillery might be called top secret uh, as as Crafty has pointed out, so you can guess all you want. It's actually there front and center, but the first ever barrel of top secret distillery in the UK. <laughs> yeah, that's it. You know, that would be worth a lot of money if you start, start a distillery called Top Secret Distillery. It's like, yeah, mm. it, would, it would get a lot of disappointment if every person going, you know, oh, I can't tell you, it's Top Secret. And they're like, yeah. oh, awesome. It's like, no, uh, it's not uh, us. It's not us. Uh, uh, someone else, but yeah, it's Top Secret. Would it, would it be like the um, the chairman's lounge in you know for, for Qantas in in Sydney Airport where you sort of have to know where to find it the cellar door you can't just go and rock up there's no there's no Google Maps you, you have to, find it. to get to the cellar door you got, you got to send a text message first before you get yeah. let in it's not going to be the speakeasy yeah yeah, yeah. No, it's it's a special up. special knock you know yeah. knock and tap and dance the door's right next to the Krispy Kreme but you don't know that you know it's yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Uh, well, um, um, it's, sorry, go on. There you go, you no, got me on it. No, it's just, it's a, it, it must have been <clears throat> you dealing with, and I remember the, the UK um, ambassador for Diageo <clears throat> always complaining in a, in a joke that his, his job was one of the hardest because you know, you've got the Kettle One ambassador and the Don Julio ambassador. It's just like, you've got to learn one product, maybe two or three variants of the SKU. So, if you're the whiskey ambassador, you've got to learn, you know, what, what is it, 30, 30 odd distilleries in the portfolio? Well, you know, at, at Diageo, um, yeah, it was like 28 when I was there. There's more now with Barora going yeah. online. Uh, and and so, I hadn't done a bottling from Rose Isle as well, so you didn't have to talk about that. Then they had, you know, they, they had the odd secret sort of distillery as well. Um, but, you know, it's, it's actually set me up really well working for Diageo. Uh, working for an independent bottler because what do we bottle we bottle a whole, whole lot of uh distilleries that are owned by diageo um because so much of their liquid which is amazing liquid goes into uh you know goes into fillings and uh you know we pick from there some of our great casts i mean i'm drinking right now um a teen Inic as well liverdale teen Inic, which i absolutely love um I've, i was just having a ben rennis before i've got a dal ewan right there um, you know, some of it, I've got a Kalila behind me. So I, I, no, there's, there's there's so many. Um, so it is, it is quite handy um, having that knowledge um, you know, working for Diageo. Mm -hmm. Not that we you know, get to visit all of those distilleries. Many of them don't have visitor centers. They don't really have established brands. So even you know, one of the great things that did happen when I was working for Diageo, they did send me around Scotland, which was absolutely amazing. But um, you know, half the distilleries I went to, I was, wasn't able to get into even working for Diageo, mm. so, um, you know, it was, was, was tough, but, um, but, it, but it's a superb base of just like, the broad depth of, 
of whiskey making and as you say those workhouse distilleries that yeah, you know, it was between Diageo and Perno. There's there's so many distilleries that no one talks about except in independent bottlings. Well, and or, or unless you're working for Johnny Walker or Chivas Regal and actually talking about the blends that go into the whiskey. So well, it's probably one of the best finds I've had since working for um, Adam Brands and, and Boutique is um, I found a love for Glen Talkers, um, which I, I know Dave Worthington loves, but God damn, yes. that stuff is good. It's so good. And uh, like you just never see it except for um, through Indies. I know they did like a, a release for um, uh, Duty Free a while back, uh, but bottled under the Valentine's label. But God, but, uh, like Glen Talkers, I'm absolutely in love with, and I haven't uh, haven't gone wrong with an indie Glen Talkers I've tried yet. The boutique cast batches, whatever you guys have access to, have been exceptional though. Like I, I think they've actually been a step above other. Um, you know, uh, Glenn Togger's releases um, going around, um, which is really cool. A question here from Frank Murphy, which may not be boutique related, but um, someone in, in the panel might know, why hasn't there been a regular release from Rose Isle yet? Oh, God, when were they founded? 2006? No, 2009. It was a bit later. Um, oh, God, I don't know. You'd have to ask someone in um, higher up in Diageo than I ever was uh, why there hasn't been a release there. But it is primarily designed to go into... It's a workhorse um, distillery. I mean, it's it's yeah. a yeah. I mean, it's I'm I'm sure a few weeks, maybe maybe there's a few casks floating around, uh, but no, nothing. I, I I haven't we haven't got a code for them yet at the it's, side. You know, that, so I, yeah, it's not really it's, it's it's similar to um, and I can't remember the name of it now. Per, Perno's newest distillery that's that beautiful glass house mm. um, facing. I drove up there the day they opened and poked my eyes in and then left. But is that <clears> like Dal or something? Is it? What's the name of that one again? Uh, down, not yeah, down, down Munich or something like that. It was, I'm gonna get that so, wrong. Yeah, we'll work it out. I mean, I mean Rosales design, designed primarily to you know, support all their blends and um, designed to be a very versatile distillery so they can adapt it to train, you know, to produce a you know, few different styles of make. But yeah, God knows when there's going to be a release. Certainly, they've got stuff that's whiskey aged now. So, um, yeah, we'll see. I don't know. That's the, maybe that's a, that's probably a question more for our our cask buyer, um, uh, yeah, Toby Cutler. Um, so yeah, he's he's the one responsible for getting those amazing casts of um, of Glen Talkers. Uh, I know in the business he's got a nickname uh, of God. Uh, I'm not sure where that came from, but I'm sure it's to do with his uh, amazing ability to just snap his fingers and and get what he needs. So he, he does really manage to secure some amazing casks. Mm. Yeah, I want to do a quick shout out to Michael Edwards listening in uh, on Facebook. Had a dram with him the other week, so that was good to uh, put a put a face to a name. Um, it's something that we discuss here quite often on the Whiskey Roundtable, and we have over the past thirteen months, however long this has been going, is trends and you know, the way Australian whiskey, not just distilling, but the consuming trends, have gone as well. Um, Simon, you're probably in quite a unique position, having come from the bars into you know, full-time whiskey roles and having your feet in the Australian industry as well as working with brands from overseas. Um, so, I, I, like, how would you explain, you know, to people potentially overseas of where the Australian drinking palate is at the moment and where it's going and maybe how that's changed in the past decade or so? Yeah, I mean, I, I think certainly when I was in bars, there was initially a bit of resistance to Australian whiskey. Um, you know, people go, what is this stuff? You know, everyone knows that Scotch is the best whiskey. It's it, Scotch is real whiskey. I mean, we, we need to put things in context. When I was bartending, um, Suntory 12 would throw into whiskey sour. I used to drink um, Hibiki 17 and high, highballs all the time and not blink. Um, that would now probably, a Hibiki 17 highball would probably cost you like 150 bucks. If you're lucky. El Elmer T. Lee was probably kicking around as well. Oh, absolutely. Love some Elmer T. Lee. You're smashing that stuff. Like, you know, I couldn't give away Japanese whiskey when I started bartending. Um, and you know, probably the first uh, Australian whiskey that I started pouring behind the bar would have been Starwood. Um, easily would have been Starwood. I mean, I'd, I'd, I've actually got here because uh, I knew Australian whiskey would come up. I've got a miniature I was sent when I was at Bartender Magazine, uh, still writing for them, of Belgrove um, White Rye um, uh, New Spirit. Um, that was distilled in 23rd of August, 2011. Um, I still been a writing for Bartender Magazine there. And I was going, who is this crazy guy making rye whiskey in Tasmania? 
So it just it just wasn't a, a thing. It's not, it wasn't a consideration in the bar that you needed to stock Australian whiskey. But now what we're seeing more and more and more, which I think is fantastic, is bars go, you know what? We're going to champion Australian spirits. And what we're going to range in our bar is going to primarily be Australian spirits. And we might have the odd bottle of Scotch whiskey. And I do think Australian palates are changing and that we do want to drink uh, local spirits and local whiskey. And we're happy to, happy to mix with them if you can afford to, um, which is slowly changing. Um, no, is, no, the palate is, no, we are more accepting of that flavor profile, knowing that's not the same as Scotch. Mm. Really, really interesting point. I'm glad you touched on it is, is the mixing aspect because, yes, you know, 20 years ago, whiskey was, was hugely mixed. And, you know, I, you know, Boutique has that fun, adventurous sort of element to it. Um, we've got just taken a parcel of the World Whiskey Blend. Um, here at the Oak Barrel, which is a, a whiskey from, I think, seven different countries blended together and inspired by mixing it with Coke or green tea or coconut water. That's exactly it. Um, is that something that Boutique are, are, are looking at into the future in Australia, but all around the world is getting, you know, cocktail bars to put whiskey into their cocktails alongside gins and vodkas and brandies and schnapps and whatever else they want to do? Yeah, yeah, look, 100%, we want whiskey to be accessible. We want people to drink it. I mean, that's why we don't put our whiskey into a crystal decanter and in a lacquered box. I know it is designed to be drinking and it is designed to be drunk. Um, and that that is, you know, I know, we all know, I mean, I've got a collection of whiskey. I know all of you have got a shitload of whiskey bottles at home that you put away in the cupboard and going to bring out for, you know, one day for a special occasion, maybe. Um, I've got more whiskey at home than I'm ever going to drink in my lifetime. I've already reached that conclusion. I can't drink it all myself. I definitely cannot. I would not survive. <clears throat> so, no, whiskey is designed to be drunk. You should crack them open. So we do want to create more accessible whiskeys. And with World Whiskey Blend, that's exactly the idea. Boutique by nature is a batch by batch product. Um, once that batch is gone, it's gone. Um, even the price point in our 500 ml bottles might make it too expensive to throw into a cocktail. So we wanted a solution to that, and World Whiskey Blend was where we really sort of landed on that. We wanted to celebrate how the world drinks whiskey. So we wanted to create something that you could drink with green tea or coconut water or with cola or ginger ale or soda. We wanted something that people weren't going to get, you know, too stuck up about and throw into um, and th into a mixed drink. And that's what people, at, no, no, other people are doing it. We're not the first to do that. But, I mean, I think Wales is one of the sort of the first truly sort of global blends, um, you know, not just UK, Ireland and, uh, you know, Canada you know, or maybe a bit of Japan. Like we've really gone to uh, put in uh, quite a few countries in there from around the globe. So what, so what you're saying is, is not just if small. we're thirsty, we just need to head up the coast to your house and drink the stuff that you can't. I, I, yep. I'm not. I mean, there are some good bars up on the central coast, but my bar is definitely the best. I'm not going to lie. Cristiano, the Taka Bar in Terrigal, uh, a great bar, but uh, no, this is this is the spot to be. Is it, how was how was how was life up there? Um, but for people who aren't familiar, so you were living a little bit closer to Sydney, and then Sydney shut down last year, and you've you've done yeah. the, uh, the the coast change. How yes. are you, all, all your all your bottles. Um, getting rust around the lids with that sea breeze? Uh, look, the, the, it stuff does go rusty up here real quick. Um, no, it really does. Um, I, I used to be in Bondi, so I wasn't that far away from the sea before. Um, but no, I, I moved to Bondi when I had a bar down there. I used to have a uh, neighbor in Bondi. So um, no, I absolutely love being in Bondi. But yeah, come COVID, I dodge. Um, no, these days, so much is done via a screen like we're doing now. So there wasn't really a point um, in my mind and being in a city that was shut down but partly just the lifestyle change too. live across the road from the beach a couple hundred bucks less rent a week extra bedroom um you know it, it was a no-brainer for me uh and i can still still enjoy a whiskey so why not yeah, absolutely i mean Excellent. one of my favorite things to do at the moment is uh um, no i'll go for a fish and take a bottle of whiskey down to the beach with me and drink it out of a camping mug um, some would call that a problem. I think that's pretty Great. awesome. Great. <laughs> whiskey, whiskey tastes better out of tin, I reckon. It does. <laughs> Always has. It tastes better out of a used SPC tin, mate. <laughs> <laughs> what is that, uh, my, my wife and I were saying the other day, it's about a year ago now, and we've got a really great swell coming over at the Bondi at the moment. It was about a year ago when we had that crazy swell that came over uh, and it was sort of 
huge waves and freezing cold and pretty miserable. But it was at this point where it was complete lockdown and the idea of drinking on the street suddenly became a normal thing. And I remember going for walks around the beach and people were just holding a, a, a glass, wine glass, and just, you know, <laughs> just sitting there si sipping along and, and having their, their Chardonnay and, and so forth. But it was, it was at this point about a year ago that we made hot toddies um, and sat there in a, in a tin mug and we're just sitting there by the beach, just, just drinking nice warm whiskeys. On, on, on that sort of reflection, I think it's almost certainly that we should jump into the Proust questions because that's the sort okay. of okay. thing we like to hear from Proust. Um, so I'm going to throw the first question um, to, to Simon, one that brings up quite a, a, a good selection of responses, from particularly from people who either work behind bars or, you know, have written the written word about whiskey. Um, what word or phrase do you most overuse when talking about whiskey? Oh God, to think about this. I mean, it, it used to be, it used to be um, made by the sea. Um, you did a lot of work for Talisker. That's been put aside um, recently. Was uh, it really hard to get that tattoo removed from your forehead? Made by the sea? It, it was, it was. And it, it, was, was, like, it was the subline matured elsewhere that would, you know. Yeah, matured <laughs> elsewhere. And that, that was one of the things I really, um, I really struggle with. Um, but oh, man, I, I, I find that really hard. It's a hard question. I guess um, I do uh, like talking about. Um, it really allows the spirit character to you know come. For, I always use spirit character and how important that is. That uh, you know, with, especially with refill casts, we bought a lot of refill casts, not particularly active casts. I like to talk about the spirit character not being dominated by the oak, um, which I, I actually am a big fan of bourbon and refill casks. It's one of the things I really love about Scotch that we don't see enough of in Australian whiskey, but give it time, I think we will. Mm. I hope we will. Yeah, very cool. I was I was lucky yeah. enough to be in my that trip to Melbourne I uh, referenced a little bit earlier to quite a prominent Melbourne distillery um, and some of their refill casks are looking very, very good uh, at the moment. Um, we have a, a proust from the audience from Alex Dahlenberg, uh, who shall not be outdone um, in the Proust section. Um, what is your favorite whiskey memory? Um, so, I mean, this this is kind of how a whole lot of memories started. So I, I mentioned that my first distillery I ever went to was Oban. Um, and I bought a bottle of Oban uh, from the distillery. And for me, I mean, I'm not sure how much it cost me. Might have been like 40 pounds. But that was an absolute fortune for me in those days. I was working in a pub or earning like four pounds an hour. Um, no, they, that, that bottle of Oban, like I was shocked how much it cost. It might've been more than that. Um, but I held on to that whiskey for about nine months until I came back to New Zealand and on, uh, on my way back to New Zealand, I stopped off in Sydney, staying at a back, uh, backpackers in Kirribilli and, uh, my brother who lives in Australia came over and we're hanging out and I pulled out this bottle of whiskey to show him and I fumbled. And this bottle of whiskey dropped and hit the floor and i thought it was going to splat no smash it was all going to be over it actually bounced and i caught it <laughs> didn't break managed to make it back to um new zealand and uh cracked it open with my dad and uh since then um because you know uh, we've got uh, five brothers there's six of us in total uh you know uh it was a bit of a tradition that every christmas would come back to a whiskey taste and everyone would bring a bottle uh, and, uh, you know, that was quite a handy whiskey tasting having that many brothers. So it's still one of my, it's, it's kicked off some of my favorite memories of doing whiskey tastings uh, with my dad and my brothers. Um, we even had a whole charter of whiskey rules that we had to follow. They were a little bit ridiculous. Um, you know, you had to obey the highest authority, which was literally just whoever, whichever brother was the tallest was the one in charge. Um, all the, all this whole set of the rules. Highest authority, got it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's a whole set of rules. Um, you know, you had to, uh, your sporans had to be kept in a clean and tidy condition. Um, no Welsh was to be spoken or sung. It was a bit of a dig at um, my uh, my dad's uh, wife, who's Welsh. Um, there was, yeah, there was no livestock allowed in the room, all that. So they're just ridiculous rules, but some fantastic tastings I have very fond memories of. And that must, uh, that must yeah. have been hard in New Zealand. <laughs> I know, I know, right? I mean, I actually turned up, uh, that that rule actually came about. I turned up one day with a set prop for a play I was in at university, and it was a giant plastic sheep. 
and I turned up and it was at this sheep was at the whiskey tasting. So that's why they wrote the rule in. So because I did turn up with the sheep one day. Is it, is it the is it it's the after hours podcast where we talk about the sheep incident? I presume that's 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 the only fans discreet yeah. content. Of you know? course, there's going to be a sheep Once comment. Sponsored, <laughs> of course, by Belgrove as well. So yeah. <laughs> um, Matt Bailey, I hope you're taking notes because I think there should be some more rules around the society tastings and and almost <laughs> this sort of stuff would be encouraged. So the first person to get, you know. A, a a sheep into the Royal Automobile Club, where the where the Sydney tastings are held, should get the next tasting free. I yeah, think. <laughs> well, every every I, I think you can find them on Twitter. Uh, every whiskey show that we did in London, someone a couple of days before would come up with a whiskey show bingo, and just <laughs> share it to everyone and just these random things. And it, there would be you know an SMWS lapel pin, uh, intense nosing to the glass asking what's your oldest whiskey um uh, you know if you if you spot sakinda uh and things like this and it was great fun it's like every year i'd look really excited just for the the whiskey bingo it's just like oh what are they going to have this year of the things that you have to try and find that's a great yeah. idea great idea. Idea. I, turned up, I turned up to one of our own society tastings once dressed like a, a tart flambe so i was covered in uh wool and tape and it was i sort of wafted through the room like a cloud uh, I can't explain why that happened, but it did, and the club didn't seem to mind. So I'm sure you can actually get livestock in there. That's fine. Um, did anyone notice you were in fancy dress that day? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You know He's dialed up a bit. <laughs> you know what, Scotty? You know what? I'm getting in the car after this. I'm going to come around there and strangle you. Okay, so my question, my, my, my proust for you, Simon, is uh, on the back of what we've talked about, how you've worked with quite a, quite a few big brands, you've worked with quite a, a lot of amazing people, uh, the question is simply, who do you most admire? And that's the oh. uh, who do you most admire in, uh, in, in who's your your role model? Someone who you look up to is, at, in admiration. Oh, um, look, I, I guess there's there's a few people. I mean, I think no, one no, of no, the, sorry, no, sorry, again, the question I, is, it's, it's one name. It's just one I, name. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say uh, Sam Simmons at um, at Adam Brands, uh, who's oh. our head of whiskey. Um, he's such a fucking cool guy. I wish I could actually spend some more time with him, but he's been really inspiring. I love his approach to what he's doing with our whiskeys. He's been winning a crap load of awards with the new whiskeys he's bringing out um, and just really sort of pushing the envelope. And you've seen him on, on chats that we have done as well. Uh, he's he, you know, thoroughly entertaining. He, he rules um, as there you go. Alex Stanley rules. He's, he's a cool guy. One of, my, um, one of my favorite early whiskey memories was with Sam actually, when he did yeah. a tasting at the Oak Barrel actually uh, of, of Balvenie, and this is back when he was working with Balvenie, and it was um, and someone in the I think it was like the seventeen double wood or something, and and he asked for tasting notes from the audience, and someone said, mm, "Tastes a bit like like sheep dung," and I, I he got I think he got somewhat offended by that, but he also used his sort of sense of dry humor, and he said, "Do you eat much sheep dung?" And he sort of like flipped it back on everyone about their tasting notes, and oh, he must be eating a lot of sheep shit. That's cool. Yeah, he's he's great. He's um he's irreverent. He's funny. Um, so yeah, I've been really uh really impressed. And I mean, I'm I'm being I get I only only really do conversations like this with him. I haven't I haven't seen him for a long time. So um, mm. looking forward to eventually being able to get back over to um, Whiskey HQ and spend some time in his lab because um, yeah, he's he's just doing some great stuff and he's thoroughly entertaining. Um, nice. And Worthington's not bad as well. He's on the chat too, so shout out. To yeah, he's, he's also good. He's also good, but you know, like because he's, <laughs> he's also listening in, so he's great. There, there are unconfirmed reports that your Sam Simmons is uh, funnier and more entertaining than our Sam Simmons, who uh, we seem to have exported to British panel shows uh, over there. Uh, and I, I, I do cringe every time he gets up and says something, and everyone in the, on, the, on these panel shows goes, "Is this the Australian humour? Like, is that what it is?" So yeah. Uh, we, we do apologize. We're talking about the good Sam Simmons. Uh, there. He's, a, yeah. he's, a, he's, a, he's an exceptionally cat. I mean, I'm amazed. I sort of didn't realize his global reach um, until you said that he came over here for Oak Barrel because he's, he's an integral and, and a huge part of the UK scene in, in whiskey for, for when mm. I was, was there. Uh, and has. It's funny, I, I saw him very rarely in the UK because he was traveling so much. And I kind of thought he was traveling more in, in the Americas and in Europe. But he would never forget you once you met him once. I think mean, it was one of one of the most drawing things that, that sort of drew me into him straight away is you would not see him for 
15 months and he comes straight in and say how you doing what's going on you know and it's straight away into a conversation asking you something interesting asking you you know, something personal to you and it's uh it's it's an incredible skill to have for a start and you know his whiskey credentials we can talk to you for for years but <laughs> you know his personable skills actually as a as a human are yeah you, know, you instantly warm to him because he's just such a, a friendly bloke yeah yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to get him back yeah i think <laughs> absolutely i mean I, I think this whole attitude to whiskey just really fits well with boutique and with adam and sort of permeates yeah. through what we do now so right through all our brands um so yeah he's i'm really really enjoying what he's doing and i believe since he's come on i mean whisk boutique he was great before but it, it's our, our brands are really stepping up uh, in in every way in terms of quality and focus and so i'm excited to see what the future will bring we've got we've got some good people in the team and and he's 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 definitely one of the good ones so i'll come in i'm in, in on the last one yeah <clears throat> you've worn an absolute ton of hats in your career in terms of working whiskey going from commercial to ambassador to writing what would be your dream job in whiskey have you done it already or is there something that you're still yet to want to do i mean whiskey is such a, a huge category like there's always going to be something else like you can't know everything about whiskey um and I, I don't think i've had my dream job in whiskey yet um i would have to say that uh felix dare uh our cast buyer who came out here to buy the australia series his job is probably my dream job travels around the world and buys casks of whiskey to select for boutique that's pretty freaking awesome um you know one of the as i said before one of the key things for the boutique is we want to try and establish a connection with that distillery if we're going to do a bottling or collaboration with them and that sounds pretty fucking awesome so i swore again i'm gonna to have to do another shot um yeah, and, uh, and alex is in the chat there if, you, if you're listening back to this um every time someone swears she's pointing it out and we are doing shots so vicky dallenberg it didn't last for that long yeah, I have to say, a Felix Steers job sounds pretty amazing to me. Um, uh, I, I really enjoy my role at Adam, and it's been a fantastic learning curve and really loving work with the brands and, and representing what we do. Um, I, I'd, I'd love to have uh, more um, uh, more involvement in what we do with whiskey um, in one way or another um, because I, I, it's why I joined Atom. Yes, we've got some awesome gin brands. We've got drinks by the dram. We've got gifting. We've got rum but whiskey is what really excites me and why why I joined Adam. So, yeah. So, so the key takeaway, if we're going to send one sound bite to Ben at the end, it's, you know, move Felix onto a new role and you know, bring Simon into, you know, we, we'll, we'll back you. I think we, yeah, we can yeah. collectively say that, you know, there's, there's three people here that advocate you for that role. So that's, yeah. that's three sponsors. So, you know, Felix, awesome. Go Andy. find something else. Uh, it's been your time. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your support. Um, maybe look at <laughs> something else. A cushy job elsewhere, Felix. Come on, mate. It's Simon's yeah. time. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Scotty, you were going to say. Then, sorry. And then we'll play that. I don't know the name of the singer, but this is my moment. We'll just play that at the end. And if you just if you sing that for us, then I think that's, that's perfect. <laughs> we'll play him <Yeah>. out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So th there it is. Yeah, you heard it here first. Uh, Felix, congratulations, mate. You are now in the cushy job of uh, sitting in the castle, the boutique castle, and just drinking whiskey uh, for the rest of your life. Some travelling the world. Um, the next top secret release uh, from boutique is, in fact, Nips and Nibs, a collaboration of whiskies matching to fountain pens. Um, and Simon McGoram, thank you for uh, dropping those truth bums on us and uh, giving a few world exclusives here on, uh, on the Whiskey Route Table. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for having me. That was great. Thank um, you, Simon. I really appreciate it. We'll be back uh, next week. I'm, I'm doing um, Scotty's outro for him. I'm sorry. But you go ahead, si uh, Scotty. But we'll be back next week. Uh, you know, we'll be back next week, uh, no doubt. We we've got um, a special guest lined up, uh, which we'll announce shortly, which we'll work out about maybe five or six hours before we go live. Uh, we'll promise <laughs> to talk about that and we'll make sure it happens. Uh, we're very organized over here at Roundtable, along with yep. our day jobs and, of course, thinking about this every hour of the day. And waking up in cold sweats at 3 a.m. thinking about Roundtable. Uh, in the meantime, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in and watching. Thank you. Big shout out to Alex Dahlenberg, who's been uh, sick as a dog and doing her thing and keeping keep on the keep on the drugs, keep the hot toddies. You know how it goes. And uh, thanks, everyone. I love you guys as well. Yeah.
Yeah, <laughs> and she says thank you for keeping her seat warm with all the with all the swear words, Simon. It's always appreciated. <laughs> She apparently has us organized, so I'm intrigued by this. Uh... <laughs> That's really funny because I also have them organized. So it's, we're going to have some. We're going to have two guests on next week. It's going to be great. It's going to be pandemonium. All cool. right. I hope they hate each other. That'd be awesome. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Simon, thank you very much. It's been a, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Thanks everyone.